Hello, and welcome to the 2022 Christmas Q&A, the annual event where my sister Mary joins me and we sit here by the Christmas tree in our parents' house and answer a bunch of questions that uh, people sent in over the past like five hours on Twitter. Mary, how are you doing? I'm good. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Anyway, Mary, let's get to the questions. I think we're gonna start off with like a nice softball. Uh, C Smithy 16 asks, what was your favorite movie scene from 2022? You know what I'm gonna say? What? Um, the, uh, the, the scene in Top Gun Maverick where Maverick does the run in two minutes and 15 seconds and shows it can be done. Yeah, in terms of just like pure, like exhilarating filmmaking, uh, I say that movie, yeah, I saw it four times in theaters. Um, that's, that's the scene, I'm gonna go with that. Hey, guess what? I still have never seen either Top Gun movie. You should. I mean, I would like to see it, but it's just funny that I, I haven't seen either. I will say also one more thing about that scene. Mm. Um, when I saw the movie, I think a second time, um, I was sitting next to like a, an old man. The, the old guy I was sitting next to, who, who, who was there with like his middle-aged son at the end of this scene, the scene is so good. The guy pounded his, his seat, his, his armrest with excitement because he was so excited about <laughs> what happened. And if a scene can do that, it's good. Pegasus is me asks, great um, handle. Which was harder, making a feature film or making consecutive one hour plus video essays? Making a feature film by far. Because you're doing that on top of also making video essays in uh, terms of at least the editing. Oh portion. yeah, it's it's yeah. just much, much, much harder. Yeah. But like, like there's no comparison. At Matt MCC1 asks, I've noticed the majority of modern American movies, especially blockbusters, are lit in a very flat, un uninteresting way without much in the way of shadows. What do you think is behind this trend and do you think it will go away anytime soon? Hmm. That's a very complicated question. There was a lot of factors that go into it. Um, cinematic visuals always have trends. Things are always influencing each other. Mm -hmm. uh, there has obviously been, there was a long period when color grading, it, we're still in there, especially if you look at like a lot of Netflix shows, are just uh, kind of very flat. They like to kind of lift the blacks and lower the highlights and it's kind of this like gray on screen. As far as the lighting goes for a lot of these blockbusters, I think a lot of it comes down to just sort of like the workflow that they have and they're probably shot that way so that they can be shot with a ton of coverage to give them a ton of options in editing mm -hmm. so the lighting is kind of neutral and kind of works from all angles and especially then uh you know shooting on on digital uh which allows like the studio and the producers to review the footage faster than if, if it were shot on film so they're probably doing it this way so that like the higher ups can kind of like micromanage everything and they can shoot infinite options mm. uh, to basically kind of like rebuild the movie in the edit however they want. Um, so, so I think some of it's some of it's just purely aesthetic trends. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, just filmmaking workflows uh, and, and that stuff, but it's a very complicated question that there is no easy answer to. At Sarok's GG says, Andor is great and Gilroy rules. Is there another big franchise you want to see take the slow burn with normal people approach? Not off the top of my head. Uh, in general, as far as most franchises go, I would usually rather they be movies than TV shows. Mm -hmm. And so I think Star Wars just kind of has always like lended itself really well to that. It was already this, this big universe with a lot of chapters. Uh, and so, and there were all obviously like so many like spin-off books and things like that, exploring other characters. So doing a show that was like, oh yeah, let's let's just kind of like focus on like the regular people that fit really naturally into what it already was. You know, that said, just make like a, a Daily Bugle show, uh, oh. just about about the reporters, just about the regular people who live in that universe and are like covering the stories. Do something like that. What's Gilroy? Tony, I, I'm asking this. What's Gilroy? Yeah. Uh, Tony Gilroy uh, is the creator of the show Andor. Oh, okay. So it's all about Andor. Gotcha. I, yeah. I was like, is Gilroy another show? No, no. Just Gilroy made Andor. At Maximum Writer 217 says, 
I feel like a lot of blockbuster movies feel very small in scale nowadays. Go back and watch Lord of the Rings and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogies and they feel huge, while most MCU stuff feels surprisingly small, despite being set on other planets and having big battle scenes. Thoughts? Okay, um, I think I know what you mean, uh, but it's interesting because the examples you used, uh, Lord of the Rings has giant battles with thousands of people like on horseback, and the Raimi Spider-Man movies are about uh, one dude usually fighting one villain. Mm. Um, and so in terms of like literal scale, these are extremely different. Um, I think the two big things, the, the, the two factors that go into what you're talking about, um, one is just having like tangible practical sets as opposed to just being all animated green screens that are basically just like, mm. like, oh, it's like two people standing in front of nothing and then it's just a ton of shit added around mm. them. Um, obviously, the other movies had visual effects, but it was a, they were often on like, you know, s actual sets and locations. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other thing is really just like how big the emotional stakes feel. Like a, a major part of you know those Spider-Man movies is that even though the actual like real world stakes are relatively small. You, you know, the, the universe is not going to end, but the personal stakes feel so enormous and there's like so much emotion behind everything. You look at like the climax of like the first Raimi Spider-Man mm -hmm. when it's like just Spider-Man fighting the Green Goblin in like a destroyed building and they're just punching each other. But like at this point, but it, it's like this like, like operatic, like emotional peak and um, I think that's a big part of it. Just, uh, you know, people respond to like the big emotions. The big emotions can make even the smallest of actions feel huge. That's what I was gonna say. It, I think my answer would be, it's about the emotional tone of the movies. Yeah. And yeah. also there's just so many MCU movies. There are I'm so many like, of them. I think the stakes seem lower because I'm like, well, there's gonna be another. Well, and it's kind of why of you look at the way that people are, you know, have are like talking about and trying to like the trailer for like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three because it's like the last one, and we're like, oh, we really we're all very invested in the emotional journeys of these characters, and like they could genuinely die here. That like, mm. like that that feel going into this movie, it feels very different than like going into most of the others. And um, I think that's the thing that James Gunn is good at. And so, yeah. I, I mean, honestly, to go back to Top Gun Maverick, a big part of why that movie is so successful is that, uh, you know, there it like the emotional stakes of it are so big. It's like people get very invested in like the character's journeys of it. And, uh, and so even though they're not saving the universe in the climactic scene, it feels enormous. So, well, now this feels like basic screenwriting stuff, like, yeah, so if you, um, if you uh, write emotions into the script and, uh, and have the characters be uh, concerned about what might happen, um, then it will be good. Harry Dave Seven says, same question I asked last year. Favorite non-2022 film you saw for the first time this year? Kind of a cheat answer. Uh, for best movie, best not 2022 movie I watched this year mm -hmm. was uh, three movies, actually. Oh, it's a bit of a cop out. Krzysztof Kieślowski's, uh Three Colors trilogy. They played at Lincoln Center uh, this year. Uh, all three movies in the Three Colors uh, series, uh, you know, Blue, white, and red. And they also released The Double Life of Veronique, his earlier movie. And I went to see all of them. Hadn't seen any of them before. And they were some of the best movies I saw all year. And so, and look, in the Criterion Collection, they're packed together in a box set. So uh, I'm gonna say the Three Colors trilogy. Next question. James Lursch says, have you had a chance to check out any other Indian films since you saw RRR and Bahubali? I did go see uh, a very good Indian documentary this year called A Night of Knowing Nothing. But uh, all I'll say is there are plans for me to see a lot more Indian movies. Interesting question from A.H. Defender. If superhero movies do die out like Westerns, what do you hope the next big blockbuster trend is? Would we say that Westerns have died out? I would say that they are not like 
the well, leading, westerns. Maybe they're not blockbusters anymore. I mean, th there was a period where you know westerns decreased in frequency mm -hmm. uh, and stopped being like the biggest movies. Mm -hmm. um, so what could replace superhero movies? Swashbuckling space movies. Ooh. Pirate movies. It would just be cool if there was like movies, if movies with sword fights became just like a big thing. Mm. Yeah. What if it was Muppet movies? What if it was just we had <laughs> like five Muppet movies a year, but it was just like the Muppets in every genre and like the only <laughs> connecting thread was that it was the Muppets. I mean, I. What I, if they did a serious drama with Muppets? It could work. Yeah. I want to see. Miss Piggy nominated for an o for an Oscar. Could happen. Could happen. Yeah. Yash Kapoor asks, movie trend you're not looking forward to. So a trend that hasn't happened yet. Or maybe one that's like beginning that you're like, no. I don't know. Uh, movies based on TikTok videos. <laughs> Is that becoming a thing? No, but it might. Yeah, that would be horrible. Let's I'm not, not looking forward to it. Let's not do that. Connor Fearin asks, in the Charliverse, there's an alternate, okay, sorry, there's an alternative Earth where their Patrick Willems directs a movie with the same plot and cast as Mamma Mia, but instead it's based around Oasis songs. What's it called? Who sings what? <sighs> okay, okay. Okay, so it's the Mamma Mia cast. So it's the Mamma Mia cast and, it's and the, the, plot of, of and Mia. the plot of Mamma Mia. Just not of, ABBA songs. Not ABBA songs, it's Oasis songs. Oh my God. Ooh. This is um, this is all I'm gonna think about for the next week. And she's electric. It's got to be in there somewhere. Yes, she's electric. Definitely fits in, in there. Um, what I'm gonna say is, it, it's funny. I actually I know I'm much more familiar with Mamma Mia. Here we go again than the first Mamma Mia mm. because I think it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because also the first one is just like yeah, nothing happens. They just there's random scenes where something comes up and someone sings a song and then it's never referenced again. But well, like she's getting married. Well, okay, so here's- And the, the fathers, the potential fathers come to the island. Okay, okay, two ideas right now. Okay. I mean, I know the premise of it, but like, what's the plot of it? Well, yeah, there's not much yeah. of a Like, plot. there's a scene where they sing money, 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 just right. because all of a sudden for Meryl Streep is like, oh, this place is falling apart, and mm -hmm. they fantasize about having money, and mm -hmm. <laughs> it never comes. It's yeah. just an excuse to cram in songs. Yeah. But here's what I'm gonna say. Okay. So the scene in the first Mamma Mia where they sing Dancing Queen, mm -hmm. Meryl and Christine Baranski and Julie Walters, they all like dance down to the docks and the whole village comes after them. Um, I think that would be Rock and Roll Star. Okay. First track off of Definitely Maybe. Nice. This one I'm mostly picking because of who I want to sing it. So you know the scene where um, Meryl Streep and, I, and Pierce Brosnan, I, is it thing? Is it this thing SOS? He's like, when you're gone. <laughs> yes, you know, it's really bad. Because Pierce Brosnan sings like this. <laughs> that, that's, yeah. I think Pierce Brosnan should be singing Don't Look Back in Anger. Mm. Mostly because <laughs> that has like a big anthemic chorus that I think would be I so can, funny. Yeah, I, can, I can hear it in my head, I can hear it in my head. And so <laughs> Sally can. Wait, what's that B-side from? <laughs> <laughs> I've trained her so well. What's the one about? Pigs? Or like... <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. What are you talking about? It's about like lasagna. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Um, the song you're referring to is called Digsy's Dinner. <laughs> Digsy's Dinner! <laughs> it's it, Digsy's Dinner. Digsy's Dinner is not a B-side. Digsy's Dinner is on Definitely Maybe. Okay, yeah, but it's like, if there were going to be B-sides on Definitely Maybe, it would be Digsy's Dinner. Oh. I feel like th there should be a, like a group... Digsy's dinner, sing along, just when yeah. they're having a dinner, they're all sitting down. Then your friends will all go green, then your friends will all go green for my lasagna. <laughs> yeah. If it's Colin be, Firth sang that? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what are the other musical numbers in the first Mamma Mia uh, that we could insert another song into. Um, what's the... Is it the one where they sing at the end? Or there's just so many songs at the end, it just goes on forever. There's just like a, everyone's dancing, but it's not like a choreographed dancing. You're just like, I wish it would end. Right, unlike Mommy, Here We Go Again, Which where all the songs are really be beautifully yeah. 
integrated into the story. Yeah. The, the ending when it just goes on for a long time, it'll probably sing all around the world because that song mm -hmm. is nine and a half minutes long. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so that makes sense. I don't know. There's probably a scene in Mamma Mia where someone's sad, right? They could sing Stop Crying Your Heart Out. Oh, yeah. There's the part where Christine Baranski is just like, doing sexy dances with like the sexy boys on the beach. Yes. And then there's the long kind of like bachelorette party thing where yes. everyone is just, there's like a weird fever dream that goes on forever. Yep. Um, Mamma Mia is very strange. But anyway, I've given such a long answer to this. this but that was excellent. Thank you. I'm glad that you're on board with incorporating Dixie's dinner. Brandon Medley asks, what was your favorite animated movie of the year? Have you seen? A couple I have to catch up on. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio? Yeah. I hear it's good. Uh, that's actually, that's what I'm going to say. Cool. Uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Ben Davies wants to know, how do you feel about James Gunn taking over DC Studios and having a clean slate? Also, try and explain the entire situation with DC slash DCEU to your sister, assuming she doesn't already know. Mary, what do you know about, uh, DC Studios and James Gunn? I think you told me something about this at Thanksgiving, but I don't really... Remember? I don't think I did. Oh, okay. The other thing, when I hear the names, the name James Gunn, I immediately think of Tim Gunn. And then I just <laughs> picture Tim Gunn taking over for DC, which would make me really happy. Everyone's very fashionable. Well, he just knows how to make things work, Patrick. He knows how to make it work. He does make it work. Yeah. And I feel like he just, he brings a, a calming presence. I would feel really good if he were to take over DC. Is that what's happening? <laughs> no. Uh, do you know who James Gunn is? No. Well, you do. You just okay. don't realize it. James Gunn <laughs> is the filmmaker mm -hmm. who is best known for writing and directing the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Oh, I do know who he is. Yes. Yeah. You just mentioned him, and I was like, yes, yes. I did. Gunn. DC movies over at Warner Brothers have been mm -hmm. in a funny position for a while because mm -hmm. there's the whole period where it's like Zack Snyder kind of controls the whole universe. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of ended. Mm -hmm. And then they, we've been in this kind of period where it's like, well, some of the movies like Wonder Woman and Aquaman are like the version of the characters that Zack Snyder like cast and mm -hmm. set up, but then they're very tonally different. And then you've got like the Batman, which is not even set in that universe. It's just completely separated. It's mm -hmm. off, it's it's, it's 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 not the Ben Affleck Batman. Mm -hmm. And um, and you've got things like, like James Gunn also made The Suicide Squad, as in the one that came out last year. Not the dreadful 2016 Suicide Squad, but they he made- They didn't change the title, they just added a the? Yeah, like The Batman. That's their thing now, they just put thus. Um, I feel like that is dumb. Well, it's all- I, I disagree with that decision. It's also the thing, it's like, they, I don't know. That's so confusing. If you ever wanted to compare the two and then you're just like, well, in Suicide Squad, as opposed to in The Suicide Squad, that's extremely frustrating. It was a weird thing where it's like, it's technically some of the same characters, but they didn't want it to seem like a sequel because most people don't like the original that's one. That's fine. Just give it a different title. But it's, it's Suicide Squad. Just give it a different title and then have Suicide Squad in the subtitle. Like um, Rambo colon First Blood Part Two. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so because there was a whole thing where James Gunn got fired by mm -hmm. Marvel mm -hmm. uh, a while ago, yeah. and um, because uh, tweets. like because uh, like alt right people dug up problematic old mm -hmm. tweets that he already apologized for, and he got fired. And then Warner Brothers hired him to do the Suicide Squad movie, and then Disney realized they'd fucked up, mm -hmm. and then rehired him to yep. make Guardians of the Galaxy. And then he made the Suicide Squad movie, and then uh, he made a spinoff show, Peacemaker, about John Cena's character on HBO wow. Max, which is really good. And so he's been playing around in like like the DC world. He and Peter Safran, his like producing partner, got picked to straight up be the heads of DC Studios and run the entire. They actually picked an interesting filmmaker who likes comic books wow. to like run this whole thing, which I think is actually a fairly exciting um, because it's rare to have a person in that role who A, is a filmmaker who has good taste and likes comics. What's DCEU? Is that DC Europe? <laughs> <laughs> is that crazy? Like the EU? I mean, that's, I, that makes sense. Why is that so silly? <laughs> so the DCEU is... It's funny. I Was it be... the extended universe? Yes. Okay. So, All right. Well, I got there eventually, but also DC Europe. You know, it's like Euro Disney. Yep. Like maybe 
Okay. The DCEU is not actually the official term. It was a thing that is just kind of commonly used in the way that like MCU is used. Mm. Um, because I guess it's it's annoying to say DCCU. So James Gunn is running it now. Uh, even though he has made literally no announcements really uh, other uh, 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 about like what's happening, what movies they're making, um, certain there's like a lot of rumors, certain things have leaked out that like Henry Cavill will not play Superman anymore. Yes, I saw that. Um, and then he seems sad. He does, but uh, also graceful. But it was also a thing where like it got complicated because like. The Rock, when he was making Black Adam, was trying to, like, really, like, throw his weight around. And, like, mm. basically, he was like, I'm gonna, like, get a Henry Cavill Superman cameo in my movie, even though Warner Brothers is telling me not to do it. Huh. And, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it was a weird, complicated thing. Basically, some people are pissed because it seems like James Gunn is trying to, like, kind of build a bit of, like, one kind of a fresh start for the universe, which was... and um, that's fair. And I'm like, that's I totally that's fun. fair. Here, here's, my, here's my take on it all. If you're a person who's actually read comic books for any extended period of time, as Mary has, I you have. know that things get relaunched and revamped all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh no, uh, a writer you like, uh, because of some crossover event, their run on this series got ended earlier than they would have liked. And it's a bummer, um, but look, those characters will keep going forever and maybe the next run by the new creator team, maybe that'll be good. That's just the way these things go. These, there will, you, in your lifetime, you will see so many different versions of these characters in movies. So uh, I think don't be too precious about it and um, just get used to change and maybe the new thing will be great. Good pep talk. Also, maybe they should um, start a DC Europe. James Gunn, listen to Mary. You heard it here. Brian Lauer says, what was the sequel trilogy like in another universe? I don't know what that means. Referring to the Star Wars sequel trilogy, episode seven, eight, and nine. Why didn't he specify that? Because if you say it, it in a reply to me, the sequel trilogy, I know what it means. And most people who watch my videos know what that means. In the way that if you say the prequel trilogy, you know it means Star Wars episodes one, two, three. Um, anyway, in another universe, maybe JJ did not direct The Force Awakens and maybe they had used Michael Arndt's script, which I hear is very good. I've said this before, but again, if anyone out there has a copy of the Michael Arndt draft uh, of Star Wars Episode Seven. please send it to me. I want to read it so bad. Jake Rapucci wants to know, what would you rather have two years from now? A new Knives Out movie or for Ryan Johnson to make a completely new and unrelated film? I am excited for the third Knives Out movie, mm -hmm. um, but I'm basically always gonna, in, with a question like this, I'm always gonna choose the original movie because uh, you never, it's, it's like a bit more of a gamble, uh, but it's like, I would be most excited to see something new, um, but I'm always just happy to get any Ryan Johnson movie. All right, Danny Cox asked the question that I think America really wants to know. How is the Oscar campaign going for your parents supporting actor, actress nominations? You know, we've really got to kick that yeah. for your consideration campaign off. Yeah, we got to hire some publicists. I know. Can you just see on the Oscars right now? Her Oscar clip is definitely her giving the speech of consuming TCM wine <laughs> in a bacchanalian frenzy. <laughs> and he grew that ghastly beard. It was terrible. The beard? I hated that beard. Well, everyone watching loved it. No. How crowded does the supporting actress feel this year? Not too crowded. Not there, too, there's room they're, for my they're, mother. They're searching for actresses to nominate. What yeah. about dad? Yeah, I mean, I mean, dad has some good stuff. Dad has some great stuff. It's yeah. Too bad that you couldn't submit the, the Reagan, uh, rant. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing. Yeah, if we could submit the videos as well. I don't know. Maybe maybe for the Emmys, the stream streamies, the Webbies. Do those still happen? Yeah. They do, huh? Nebula lost a streamy this year oh. uh, to uh, Tampax. <laughs> it happened last month. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mm. Yeah, it was rough. Another Patrick, Patrick Walls, wants to know. This year. I started watching Tony Scott's films and I loved his movies starring Denzel. Who doesn't? Do you have a favorite two or three of those? Here, here's the thing. I think Tony Scott's best movie is also his best movie with Denzel. It's Crimson Tide. 
of if you want me to rank Tony Scott's movies uh, with Denzel, uh, which oh, what what a pairing that was, Crimson Tide, Unstoppable, Man on Fire, Taking of Pelham One Two Three. So I have never seen Crimson Tide, and I, I don't know what that is, but we just mentioned Tampax, and it really sounds like a movie of that period. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a movie from 1995, mm-hmm. starring Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's set on a submarine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is there one woman on the <laughs> Period, and the men just freak out and they don't know how to handle it. <laughs> See, Mary, you're allowed to make that joke. Yeah. I can't. This is like Seth Meyers jokes you can't make. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's like a woman having a normal period, and the men are just freaking out, panicking. <laughs> yeah. You know, Mary, if you ho- <laughs> if Mary, if you had hosted the Oscars in 1995, that would have been a great opening monologue joke. Yeah. This is the best Q&A ever, automatically now. Oh, boy. Quiet Time Aquino says, what would you rather see? Paddington in a Fast and Furious movie or John Wick crossing over with Mission Impossible? Easy. Easy. Paddington in Fast and Furious. Yes. Because I don't want anyone crossing over with the Mission Impossible movies. Uh, The Mission Impossible franchise is so perfect at what it's doing that... If they did all this, like, wacky crossover stuff, uh, you know, as if it was, like, you know, Friday the 13th crossing over with Nightmare on Elm Street, no. That 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 stuff is beneath that series. That is, our, that is the greatest franchise in movie history. Yeah. Fast and Furious is already wacky enough that I think it could, it could withstand Paddington, Paddington could showing up. Paddington could join the Familia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean— He do- could be around the barbecue table at the end— he could be past a corona. And yeah, then knowing he, Paddington, he'd probably decline. He'd decline. Say, and, and I'm he'd, a young and, bear. Exactly. Yeah. And he'd have a sip of tea. Yeah. And, and don't you want to hear Dominic Tretta say, like, that's a good bear. <laughs> Mary, Mary, do your impression of, uh, of uh, Dom Toretto saying that's a good bear. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll do the only Dominic, well, the only Vin Diesel impersonation that I can. This is really this. good, guys. She's been, she's been working on this for a while. The movie. <laughs> That's as deep as my voice can go. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> oh boy. Think of all the questions that we're not going to get time for because of this. Yeah. Petra Halbor says, do you have strong opinions about them splitting the adaptation of Wicked into two films? I love that musical dearly and this decision should either buff up underwritten characters like Fiero, or become a bloated mess like The Hobbit. Thoughts? Um, I have never seen the musical Wicked. I don't know the story of it. I have no opinion on them splitting into two movies. All I know is that most people I know who are familiar with uh, with the show uh, think it's a bad idea. And so I'm like, I don't know, I guess so. Let's trust them. Yeah, sorry. All right, Dr. Forrester asks, what was the most bizarre movie you discovered when researching your 80s movie uh, video? I need to get out my computer and open back up the spreadsheet of the of movies that I made. Hmm. There were so many weird movies and I've forgotten most of them. Yeah, the ones I'm thinking of are, are You're the Hunter from the Future, Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin, and... Solar Babies. I should just release a long list somewhere of just like the the top strangest movies uh, I discovered because there there were a lot. This person's name is Fourth Friggin' Chairman of the Friggin' Tojo Clan. And that's funny to me. Um, But they ask, what is completely subjectively your favorite mystery detective movie? Hmm. Oh God. Quick, snappy. I couldn't stop at that hand. Snappy. Zodiac? There you go. We're going with that. 400th KBY says, I know you have aspirations to work as a director and have a short film prepped for next year. Night of the Coconut was a comedy. Will you be sticking in that mode or do you have dramatic aspirations as well? I do. Uh, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I my movies, the, ones that I, the movies I'm interested in making lean a little bit lighter. Uh, I'm not looking to make like 
you know, deadly serious, like, domestic dramas and movies about real world tragedies and stuff like that. I don't I don't think my future film work is going to be quite as like broad broad and wacky as Night of the Coconut. Uh it'll still be lighter and like and and you know some and and like a varying levels of comedic but not that goofy all the time. Yeah. 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 Cool. Skylar 8158 says will Michael Mann's Ferrari movie usher in a new golden age of dad cinema? So I'm very excited about Michael Mann's Ferrari movie, but I think with Michael Mann's kind of like formal experimentation, if you, you know, the way he uses like digital cinema and Miami Vice, uh, Black Hat, stuff like that, I don't, I think that's a little, a little bit too out there to be like regular dad cinema. The thing is, if we're talking about Ferrari movies, Ford versus Ferrari basically already did that. I think... I, I think it's highly unlikely that Michael Mann's Ferrari movie will be more of a quintessential dad movie than Ford vs. Ferrari. It might be better. Uh, I really like Ford vs. Ferrari, and I'm really excited for Michael Mann's Ferrari movie. But, um, but that is such a dad movie in a way that I don't think Michael Mann would do. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Solid answer. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Are you looking forward to Michael Mann's Ferrari movie? I didn't know that was a thing. I don't know anything about it. Adam Driver plays Enzo Ferrari. Ah, uh-huh. is it like the origins of Ferrari? I think so. Cool. Yeah. I probably won't see it. No. If, if it's I good, mean, I might, if it's good, I'll text you. But I'll be like, Mary. It's not at go, the top go, of go see one of your list. three movies of the year. Well. Maybe I will. Actually, you've seen at least four movies in theaters this year. Yes, look at me. More, more than last year. Luke Latore asks, best song off of Midnight's. What do you Ooh. think? What do you think? We were just talking about this. Yeah. Um, uh, the ones I feel like I've listened to the most are Mastermind and You're On Your Own Kid. I feel very strongly that it's You're On Your Own Kid. Yeah, it's the fifth song. It's the most like emotionally vulnerable song. Like she always does that. The fifth song on the album is also always like the big. And this one really lives up to it. I think it's, I think it succeeds where a lot of, where I think about a third of the album falls flat. You're on your own kid. You always have been. Yeah. Swiper the Cat FF says, will Avatar 2 bring about a new wave of 3D post conversion lasting years like the last Avatar did. I've been really curious about this because the thing was, uh, we, when the first Avatar came out, uh, 3D was not a common thing in movies. And so I feel like it was like more of a novelty and the studios got really swept up in it. And, and I feel like initially a lot of viewers were just like, well, 3D, that's a cool new thing. Let's mm-hmm. go see that. And then people got very burnt out on 3D and mm-hmm. got very sick of it. And it really died out in popularity. The thing is, unsurprisingly, like one of the only people who can do 3D effectively is James Cameron. And Avatar 2 uses it really well. Like 3D, that movie is great. Uh, and I think, I think this will definitely give, us, give it a boost. Um, I think the bill now that audiences are more discerning and I think studios are aware of this again. And so what this might mean is, is you might get more of that thing like when like Scorsese made Hugo and Quaron made Gravity where it's like uh, because of a like a slight resurgence in interest in 3D, you might get more cases of like interesting filmmakers using 3D in a deliberate way Wait, again. Was Gravity? Did Gravity have 3D? Yeah, we saw it together in 3D. I'm X 3D. We saw that movie together. I don't remember it being in 3D at all. It was. It was? Yeah. We were wearing glasses? Yeah. I don't remember that. But this is the thing. Clearly, it, it did not detract from your experience because you were wearing them and were probably just very immersed and very engaged in the movie and... It is a movie about my biggest fear, which is drifting off into space and dying alone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, know. I was distracted. But yeah, I'm 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 curious what will happen with the 3D because uh again it was one of those things where you know, saw Avatar that way and I was like, man, when someone does this well, it's good. <laughs> Nathan Hardesty says, What are your top three anythings that you're looking forward to the most next year? What are you looking forward to in 2023? 
I always, especially at like the end of a year, beginning of the next year, I always just forget what is scheduled for the year ahead. You're going to the Bahamas. Oh yeah, I'm looking forward to going to the Bahamas. Okay, you know what? It, it, this is number one, two, three, because I'm going to see it three times. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. There's nothing else I am really? more excited for. Come on, nothing else? I don't know. I can't remember what else is happening. You know, I, like I don't know. Trips? My, Michael Mann's Ferrari movie. No. Well, I don't have any other trips booked. What? Well, you're going to the Bahamas in January. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah, that would be like first on my list. I'd be like, it's coming up soon, so it's top of the list. What about... Yeah, but Mary, no Mission Impossible movie. All right, you, yeah, that is kind of... <laughs> Have you seen that trailer? No. After this, we're watching the okay. trailer. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Vito Solerio asks, what was your favorite theatrical experience of 2022? RRR, Top Gun, Maverick, or Top Gun Maverick, Avatar, etc. It was RRR. Mm -hmm. I think especially the first time I saw RRR opening night, because like going to Top Gun, I was I had heard it was great. I was amped. Uh, going into Avatar, it was the first James Cameron movie in 13 years. I was amped. Uh, going into RR, I was like, well, this looks cool. Let's see what this is. And then it was like a life-changing experience. <laughs> Those rare moments where you go into a movie not fully knowing what you're about to experience, mm -hmm. especially a movie like that that is so big and like, you know, has the entire audience like freaking out and cheering and everything. Like nothing this year in terms of theater experiences could possibly top RRR. That makes sense. I'm yeah. happy for you. Thanks, Mary. That sounds really nice. Yeah. Mary hasn't seen RRR yet. No, I want to. Mary lives in Vermont, where they did not get RRR in theaters. No, we did. And I missed it by a couple days. It was only in theaters for like one week, maybe two weeks. I'm so sorry. But it was only in Burlington. I get it. But you'll see it. You'll come visit me in yeah. New York, and we'll see it in the theater. Yeah, I'm astounded it's still playing. Yeah. It's the best movie in the world. Camerong64 once, or says, uh, this is a part two to my question from last year, which Mary picked for the video. Did you manage to get tickets to the Eras tour? No. <laughs> so here's the thing. I didn't actually try. Yeah. This was a thing where I thought about it. Mm -hmm. And then the day that it was happening, everyone had to do the thing where they had to like sign up just to qualify for like the pre-sale, mm -hmm. you know, and then Ticketmaster screwed up and like mm -hmm. drove millions of people insane. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, uh, by the time it was happening, I was like, oh, I should have, I should have made plans before this. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's one of those things where I should have texted you, but you had plans, you were talked about with like two of your friends, well, right? Two of my best friends, uh, the three of us wanted to go together. And then they were, I'm like notoriously very bad at, um, being organized to buy concert tickets. So like they were on top of it. Um, and then I, maybe they didn't qualify for like the pre-sale thing. It was just not a good experience for anyone. It was a thing where I was like, oh, I, I might want to go to that, but I don't want to go to a stadium show alone. I'll go to like a small concert yeah, at like Webster me. Hall. We yeah, I should have just texted you. Uh, basically, I realized when it was happening, I was like, oh, I should have made a plan and like seen if like Mary wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I don't know if anyone loses their tickets for an East Coast stop on the Air Store. <laughs> let us know. Well, it's also like the big issue is that like so many of them got bought up by companies that are then going to be reselling. Them. I mean, reselling Ticketmaster like ha has upside. a terrible model and uh, uh, everyone hates it. Everyone also, hates there's always that it. thing where it's like, it seems like it's the only reason to have an American Express card just to get like priority ticket buying. Yeah, that's why I they have it. that really douchey commercial for American Express where this guy's like, I got dumped by my girlfriend, but now I'm going on dates with these women and they're so impressed because I got all these like early access to tickets because of my American Express. Thanks American Express for making me look cool to women. I haven't seen that commercial. That it's sucks. It's just like, I mean, it's... It's just lame. It's just like, does anyone think like this? Like, is this the only aspect of your personality that you have? That you have an American Express card and you can get tickets. Remember when they had fun commercials that were directed by filmmakers, yeah. like the Wes Anderson one? What <sighs> What was the Wes Anderson? They used to have ones where it'd be like a like a, like the Wes Anderson American Express commercial. It's a commercial set on the set of a Wes Anderson movie where it like follows Wes Anderson, a very Wes Anderson style like tracking shot through one of his sets mm. and he's like talking about stuff and like approving thing. It's amazing. I didn't know. And uh, yeah, they used to, that was like the, I don't know, the early 2000s. Anyway, next question. Next question. We're not going to the Arrow's door. 
George Hassler wants to know, thoughts on uh, Nakuti Gatwa and the upcoming series of Doctor Who? Apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. I'm looking forward to it. I really, I think like a lot of us, uh, I fell off in the, the most, re in like the Chibnall era. Um, like I like Jodie Whittaker. I just, uh, I just kind of fell behind and then there were like four seasons that I was behind and I was like, I'm never going to catch up. And everyone I know who's been watching it tells me it's not great. I'm just, I'm very curious about what it'll be like with Russell T Davies coming back mm -hmm. to write it. And, uh, you know, they got, it seemed like a, they had a cool cast. I'm curious about this thing with David Tennant. I'm going to watch. Yay. Yeah, I think it'll also be nice to see a Russell T. Davies' Doctor Who when they actually have more of a budget <laughs> and it yeah, doesn't look that's super real. cheap. Yeah. Mattis Nicholas wants to know, what gave you the idea for the 80s video? Someone that struggles, I think he means as someone that struggles with their love of 80s nostalgia, um, wondering how you also deal with love of the past. So I actually had the idea for that video in like spring 2020, uh, during the, like the kind of early days of lockdown. I was finishing up watching every Brian De Palma movie and I was like, I haven't seen Scarface since I was like 15. I'll watch it again. I rewatched Scarface, uh, which I think is pretty great. And, um, and, I, and I was just thinking like, man, like, is this the most 80s movie ever? Like, the aesthetics, the music, just, like, it being all about, like, absurd greed and and, uh, and materialism and wealth and everything. And I started thinking, hmm, what else could be the most 80s movie ever? Actually, and then I, and then I basically, yeah, I, I've had the idea for, like, two and a half years. Uh, and then I also had the thought of, like, it would be fun to do that as a video and then to do it with other decades as well. Oh, but uh, now you're like, never again. No, now, now I'm like, oh, I want to do it again, but I now Maybe I... not for another year. But now I need... I know, Now I know what goes into it, okay. so I, I can, like, I guess plan better. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. And so I thought the video might be an hour long, not an hour and 40 minutes long. It was so long. I really liked it, but it was long. Oh, yeah. It took me three sittings to finish it. Uh, yeah. No, that's good. It took me a month and a half to make it. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. If you think about that, if you could make a movie in a month and a half, that would be incredibly fast. Again, this is why yeah. making the feature-length film was a lot harder yeah. than making long video essays. Yeah. Edwin J. Davies. Is he related to Russell T. Davies? Yeah, probably. Probably. He asks... What was the least 80s movie from the 80s that you watched for the video? Okay. In terms of movies that I watched for research for that video, mm. this may seem like a hot take. Mm. I'm honestly going to say Dirty Dancing, which I had never... Because it's in the 1950s. You'd never seen it? I'd never seen it. What? It's great. What? I know. How have you been my brother for this long? Because you would watch it at like sleepovers with other girls. No, no. Shannon would come over and we would watch it every weekend here. We watched it like every week. Yeah, but you were very for like a year. You were very young. You were a lot younger, and at that this point, this is when I was like fourteen. Yeah, but I don't know. I was just like, I don't know. That's one of those girl movies. It's so good. It was, and it's I, about I know. abortion. I know the whole thing's about abortion. I know. So th she's holding a watermelon for so long. Yeah, it's very she, endearing. Well, she has that line. I carried the watermelon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, the thing is, there are eighties elements to it, like. There was just the, the trend of movies about dancing. Mm. Honestly, the period setting in the early 60s, mm -hmm. uh, it does kind of fit into that 80s nostalgia thing. I used the clip from the movie uh, in the video about mm -hmm. like back when things were so simple, before, mm -hmm. before you know, things got all complicated in the 60s. But in, in general, uh, it's basically just like a coming of age story, uh, not set in the 80s, pretty much other than... I've had the time of my life, which is kind of anachronistic when it comes on at the end. Yep. The music is all period specific. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a, it is a, it is an iconic 80s movie that's not really all that 80s. And it's so good. And it's, it's Go great. watch it. Watch it. Cool. <laughs> They've probably all seen it. Yeah, because they are good. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I really hate when people are shamed for not having 
consumed media. Yeah, Mary, look at all the movies you have said you haven't watched yeah, in the day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and <I've>, Clearly. <laughs> and, and I think I've been pretty nice to you. Yeah, I'm very hypocritical. Sorry. It's okay. Look, the way this goes is people are mean to me because it's my channel. Mm. And uh, and it's easy to be mean to me. It's hard to be Being mean. nice to me. It's hard to be mean to you because you're, you're, you look at you. I'm an enigma. I'm never here. <laughs> You can't follow her on Instagram. Ah, her account is private. You can try, and you will be rejected. <laughs> Sorry. No hard feelings. I just don't. Next question. Okay. All right. Ryan J. Lee 7 says, Who's a filmmaker that hasn't made a movie in a long time that you'd love to see return? You know who's long overdue for a new movie? No. Savage Steve Holland. What? <laughs> Who? He made Better Off Dead. In the 80s. And then he made One Crazy Summer, his follow-up to Better Off Dead. Hmm. I don't know if he's directed a movie since, like, 1987. What a comeback it would be. Yeah. Also, you know, there are a lot of people. Like, uh, hey, we, we Todd Field finally came back this year. Uh, I don't know. It's been a while since Catherine Bigelow made a movie. Hmm. How about her? She used to be married to... James Cameron. James Cameron, yeah. Yeah. What did she win the Oscar for? The Hurt Locker. The Hurt Locker. Yep. I know some things. Yeah. I just need you to finish my sentence. Exactly. J.M.W. Buchanan wants to know, if your sister had to pick a tropical fruit to be their mascot nemesis, what would they pick? Okay, I don't know if you know how perfect it is. This is like... This th is this the is, most Mary question. This is the stuff that Mary just casually brings <laughs> up to me at random times. So it was particularly a big thing when I was in high school where I would just ask people a lot of hypothetical questions and I'd be like, if you were a fruit, what fruit would you be? And we all go, I don't know, <laughs> what, who, who cares, who thinks about that? And then you always had an answer ready. Yeah. Well, Mary, uh, if you had to pick a tropical fruit uh, to be your mascot slash nemesis. That... Oh, okay, so I feel like we have to pick two because one has to be my mascot and one has to be my nemesis. So... I, I'm so happy this question is for you, not me, because I do not have an answer. Um, okay, mangoes are the most delicious. Um, and then papaya, I really hate papaya. Okay, so I'm going to say the papaya would be my nemesis, and mango would be my mascot. There you go. You heard it here. <laughs> Aren't you so glad that you watched this video? I, like, I've heard it. I don't know if it's a thing like cilantro, but I, I know some people love papaya, but I have talked to so many people. It just, it, like, it smells moldy to me. Like, there's something about the way papaya, I don't know. It's your nemesis. It's my nemesis. Sorry. Okay, uh, Manish Tawani wants to know... What's something you wish you knew about directing when you first started? Does this mean like when I first started in like middle school? I think you can interpret this as you wish. I mean, I'm picturing, I always think of you in like high school with the Shelf Luck and Wafsa movies when you were like, you were working with a cast of your friends and you were like legitimately directing other people. Okay, okay, yeah. for, for, if I'm going back to like high school me, I'll give two pieces of advice. Uh, one, um, when you put a song in a movie, you don't have to use the entire song. You can edit it down. So instead of that montage being three and a half minutes long, it's, uh, I don't know, one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would be good. Um, also, uh, rehearse more. Man in the Spider and Masks says, I missed RRR in theaters. Is it still worth watching at home without the giant crowds? Well, this is a question that's also relevant to Mary. Yes. So here's the thing. It's um, it's not just about the giant crowds, because not every time you see it in a theater, especially if it's playing for a while, it's not always going to be sold out with people throwing confetti in the air. Because also a lot of those... Was there confetti? Literally. Uh, not in my theater, mm. but uh, in... Uh, actually, wait, no, I think the first time I saw it, because it was a mostly Indian audience. That's um, amazing. It's more of an Indian thing, throwing confetti in the theater. Mm. Um, the thing is, the, the the biggest reasons I think not to watch it on Netflix, even though I know many people who have only watched it on Netflix and they had a great time, um, on Netflix, it is in the wrong aspect ratio. Mm. Uh, it, the movie is shot in CinemaScope. There should be like the letterboxing black bars on the top and bottom of your screen. On uh, Netflix, they expand it to fill the whole screen. Mm. Um, so it's just 16.9. Uh, also on, on Netflix, it's in the wrong language. It is dubbed into Hindi, and the movie is in Telugu. So, Natu Natu, a.k.a. the best original song in 2022 cinema, is uh, is changed to Nacho Nacho, which is 
fun, but not the same thing. No. The thing is, there is a streaming service uh, for mostly Indian films called Z5, Z-E-E, number five, hmm. where you can watch RRR correctly. Cool. Um, so you could check out that. The thing about seeing it in a theater is it's just the movie is such a big, overwhelming spectacle um, that I just think that's really the ideal way to do it. Like, see it on the biggest screen you possibly can. But if you have to watch it at home, if it's your only option, I would look into Z5 instead of Netflix. That's a good recommendation. Thank good you. Good tip. The Iceman2288 says, now that Amazon owns James Bond, should they look into spinoffs and maybe even a TV series? No! I Stop doing that. that with that. Not everything needs to be a cinematic universe and ha and should be a TV show. No. Just make make a new James Bond movie every two or three years, and that's all it needs to be. I don't want a TV show. I don't want to spin up. Like, look, I, 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 nothing against Miss Money Penny, but I don't need a Money Penny origin TV show. Did they do that? No, they didn't. Okay. Um, but for instance, uh, are you aware that there's a show called Pennyworth, the origin of Batman's butler? That, that, I just saw a teaser for that, and I was like... That said, I, I do have a couple friends who have told me the show is actually just like a pretty good, like, 60s set British spy show. Okay. But the idea that it's actually called Pennyworth, colon, the origin of Batman's butler is basically a joke from Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Mm. Uh, so yeah, no, no, leave James Bond alone. Just make movies. Leave him alone. Justice Seymour says, which would you want to see? A new... Superhero or not, movie from more. Shane Black or Sam Raimi? Shane Black. Um, well, that's what I would say. Yeah, but but more of both. We finally got a Raimi movie after nine years, and uh, but more, more of both. But my thing is just like, oh, just like the I, if we get another another thing like the Nice Guys, oh, there's nothing I want more. Give me give, give me another hit of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Armando Marchetti, it's a nice name, says, did you read Seth Rogen's autobiography? There's an insane story about him meeting George Lucas, who apparently said he had a private spaceship ready for the 2012 apocalypse. Spielberg was in the same room rolling his eyes. <laughs> kind of sounds like a deleted scene from Night of the, Night of the Coconut. Uh, I have not read Seth Rogen's that autobiography, fun, though. but uh, you have now sold me on yeah, Seth Rogen's that autobiography. my interest. That sounds great. Yeah, I, I also love the detail of Spielberg just being like, oh, George. Oh, George. Come on. Come on, George. <laughs> uh, I could also see that being, uh, because George Lucas seems um, to be a hard man to read. Yeah, I could uh, see that being a joke, just like a deadpan joke. Yeah, yeah. That, that he just likes to say to people because pe he is aware that people are, are like, uh, this is George Lucas, I'm stressed out. Is he being serious? Yeah. I don't know how to react to this. Yeah. As we all know, uh, George Lucas, you know, has a sparkling personality mm -hmm. and uh, is an incredibly charismatic man <laughs> and uh, has an incredible sense of humor. <laughs> a Varanian scribe says, reading any cool books lately? I have, uh, I have like 10 pages left in The Ivory Grin by Ross McDonald. Uh, it did not autofocus to this. This year, I've gotten really into like old detective novels from the 50s, especially the Lou Archer books by Ross McDonald. Uh, I've read a bunch of these and uh, they're awesome. If you like Shane Black movies, uh, these, these books are like one of his biggest influences. And before this, um, I read The Kid Stays in the Picture, the, the memoir by Robert Evans, which was a blast. So uh, yeah, that's what I've read lately. Claude Zilla Jr. says, how many times did hashtag make Adam Cannon appear in the, the replies to this? I don't know, Mary, how many? Um, so far like three times, but um, I don't even know if I'm halfway through these questions. I also don't know how many more questions we're gonna get through. So sorry if we don't get to your question, there were a lot. Yeah. Next question. All right. Vanderstorm asks, uh, I hope you got to take another vacation this year. Me too. What other European city do you want to spend a couple days sampling coffee shops in? I think you picked this question because you just like the idea of me taking more vacations. I do. Uh, well, last time, so I, for those who don't know, I went to Stockholm last July mm -hmm. uh, and I did spend most of the vacation sitting at many of the coffee shops in the city and uh, reading. Um, and drinking a lot of coffee. Um, I came very close to going to Oslo, mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and so maybe Oslo is next. Maybe I'm just gonna be a Scandinavian boy. And also, uh, after I saw The Worst Person in the World, mm. uh, I, which is all set in Oslo, I was like, ah, oh, that city looks so cool. I wanna go so bad. Mm. And, um, and so that might be next. So, Oslo residents, watch out. I, I may show up at some point. I like how that sounded like a threat. Yeah. Watch out. Okay, this is a really hard-hitting question from the Tate. Best Oikos flavor? <laughs> you know, I wish I got this question earlier because <laughs> no joke, just a couple hours ago, I was with the Torpies. I was at the Torpies' parents' house. Mm -hmm. Hanging. Wait, were all four torpies? Then? No. Oh, okay. Um, uh, no. Just, uh, just for those who are doing, you're all, you all know Matt Torpy and Jake Torpy. Uh, there are there are two more Torpy brothers. There's four in all. Uh, My favorite uh, moment from the premiere of Night of the Coconut was when I saw this man from across the crowd, and he was a he was a little younger than me. He had a beard. And I couldn't help but just stare at him and for a long time. And I was like, wait, this is, I've stared at this man for too long. But I was like, I feel like I know him and I can't place where I know him from. And then finally he like made eye contact with me and we like went up to each other. And I said, do I know you? <laughs> and he said, I think so. I'm Mark Torpy, who, which is the youngest Torpy brother. Um, and the last time I saw, Mark, he was going by Marky, and I well, think his, was his ten. Well, fam his his family was <laughs> calling him Marky. Yeah, but he was a small child the last time I saw him. Um, so but I you was, can tell this seems like <laughs> a he torpy. Looks, he looked like a torpy. Yeah, but I couldn't place him anyway, so I was just really creepy about it. Any, yeah. that, sorry, you're very, you, but you were you didn't at tell me that. <laughs> but, 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 but look, before we before we went on this torp tangent, um, the reason <laughs> I started it because I was gonna say. Uh, I don't think I've ever actually eaten Oikos yogurt, and the Torpies would have been the ones to ask. Yeah. Because, as anyone who watched our live stream knows, uh, they, Matt in particular, ate a lot of Oikos. <laughs> also, the Oikos commercial uh, with the pig man uh, that was written by Matt. Mm. Uh, Matt played the pig man. Um <laughs> So yeah, I think I think Matt Torpy is is really the Oikos expert or uh, Oikspert, uh, who you should oh, ask. Oh no! The leftist cook wants to know: Do you have more ideas up your sleeve for new directions to take the video essay format in, or do you feel like you found your balance with the innovation? I'll say uh, I think you you can expect to see the format uh, evolve a little bit in Ooh, the year ahead. Teaser. Basically, uh, I don't like just doing the same thing over and over again. You get bored. It, it's always gonna be changing in some way. Cool. This question is slightly confusing and I like it. It comes from it me Cole one and they ask, who has the best taste in winter apparel? I enjoy it because it's not who who has like the best fashion sense in winter apparel, but who has the best taste? So it could just be someone who like sits on their couch and wears sweatpants, but they have the best taste in winter apparel. Oh, it could also mean which of us. Oh. It could be which of us are who in who general. I mean, generally I think Patrick is a little more fashion forward than me. <laughs> I think you're more up on the trend? I like to introduce myself to people and say, hey, what's up, I'm Patrick, I, I'm a little fashion forward, <laughs> you could say. I like am I, I the, like. Am I on the, the trends? I, I'm i just like, like, I like turtlenecks and horizontal Mary, I just I, want to point out, Mary right now is wearing the most Patrick Willems outfit imaginable. It wasn't planned. I just like the sweater. Maybe we just have some taste. But I feel taste. like you wear like cool trousers now. Like you've got like cool pants. And I've so do just, you. I just wear jeans. But but winter winter apparel. Winter apparel. I wear a winter coat that looks like a duvet. <laughs> <laughs> and it has a massive hood. It's incredible. This it, is true. It, it, it like goes like this around my head and I'm in a cocoon and I you, I just disappear. I look so small and tiny. Um, so I, And that's, that's fun. This sounds very cozy. It's cozy. 
I also like a lot of things that I don't wear. Like once again, coming back to taste, I think I have pretty good taste. Am I always like the fashion plate for that taste? No. Anyway, we've really debated this a lot. We also just talked about your taste. Uh, I, I think I have complimented you a lot, and then you've been like, ooh, compliments. <laughs> ooh, compliments. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I've described how I, I live in a duvet in the winter. Here's what I'm going to say. I think it's painting a picture that I'm not the most fashionable. But, but that's not the question. Was, uh, Mary, I think you have good taste. Thanks. Great. This is right. where you say, Patrick, you have good taste. <laughs> oh, shit. And then, and then it can be balanced out. You have very good taste. I was about to say something that might be rude. I was about to say, maybe I have slightly better taste, but you wear better clothes. See, it was like a backhanded compliment. Oh, this is funny. Okay, uh, Curly Bert wants to know, what part of Ireland is your mom from? Or your man from? Um, how Are your mom from? No, they asked, is your man. Oh, ma'am. Your man, your mammy. Um, how did she end up with a lacrosse player? <sighs> Did she confuse him for a hurler? Great question. Have you ever been to her home and have you enjoyed your visit? Bonus question. Worst Irish accent you've ever heard in a movie. Irish. Irish. Oh, I could give you the, the worst Irish accent you ever heard oh, right now. Terrible. Oh, oh Mary. <laughs> what do I even do? I, I'm always in Jimmy Stewart now. Um, um, our mom is from County Clare. County Clare, Ennis. The West Coast. The West Coast. West is best. That, but th th that sounded very Kark or, or Kerry. Yeah. West. West, uh, she ended up. Or she's from the West. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, we have been back to Clare many times. We when used to we go were, every we summer. We used to go every summer for a whole month. So we've spent a lot of time there. We have um, a very big family. Though, we have there. 20 first cousins. Uh, my mom is the only one of her immediate family that's left Ireland, so we've got a bunch of family back there. And what happened was, in, our mother came to America in 1980, mm -hmm. then ended up uh, in our hometown of Saratoga Springs, mm -hmm. where my dad also happened to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they were both uh, working with horses at the, the Saratoga racetrack. Yep. Uh, and, um, and that was it. And they fell in love. Yeah, and then, she and then we stayed. came along. And um, yeah. uh, I will say, my dad being a lacrosse player, mm -hmm. uh, he does enjoy hurling quite a bit because yep. he's like, ah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's like they have so much in common, but hurling is like the more ancient version. Yeah, and if you don't know what hurling is, go look it up. I don't know up. why, but this hurley, I think this might be a trial size hurley. Yeah, it looks a little small. Um, has just been sitting, sitting like in the house. dining room uh, since we got home. And uh, anyway, here are our Irish credentials. Yeah. Um, a Hurley. Up the back. And we have no Schlither around here. Yeah. And uh, we can. You look yeah. like you're going to hit me in the head. With I know, I can hand pass it to you. Uh, hand pass it, Pat. Oh, worst Irish accent uh, ever heard in a movie. I, I will say my pet peeve when people do Irish accents is when they they think that they need to add like a melodic lilt to every single line that they say, and so it all sounds like they're repeating this melody when they talk. It's very annoying. And if I honestly can't watch movies with bad Irish accents, I just have to turn it off. I, I mean, uh, I think the most, there's, there's, I really enjoy this one, but uh, one of the more cartoonishly bad ones is um, uh, Sergeant O'Hara in the 1966 Batman. That one is pretty funny. Oh, if I only had a nickel for every time he's <laughs> baffled us with one of his criminal conundrums. Ah. <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that it's a it's a bad one, but uh, but it's also great. Yeah. Shut up, Cooper asks. Thoughts on Bob Fosse? Bob Fosse. Mm -hmm. Um. So until this year, the only Bob Fosse movie I had seen was All That Jazz which I think is a masterpiece. Mm. And then this year, because the Blank Check Boys uh, did a series on Fosse, and he hasn't made very many movies, I was like, ooh, I'll watch all the other ones and uh, follow along. I, I'd, I'd never seen Cabaret. Um, oh, I think that's the only one that I've seen. That's, I mean, that's probably the one most people have seen. Yep. Um, he, he only made, what, five movies? Did he make Sweet Charity? Yeah. That, that one his, seems like the weirdest. It's his first movie. It, it's, it is weird. I mean, I kind of want to see it just because it looks... Bizarre. Yeah, it's yeah. um right. There's Sweet Charity, Cabaret, 
uh, Lenny, all that jazz, and then Star 80. Oh, oh man, Star 80. Uh... Uh, a it sounds ru- like you didn't like it. No, no, I, I think it's I think it's a really good movie. It is just a. Do you know what Star Eighty is about? No. Do you know the story about Dorothy Stratton, the uh, the Playboy playmate who was murdered by her husband who That's had killed himself? Interesting. I literally was just listening to a podcast where they mentioned Dorothy Stratton and that whole murder, suicide, and it was the first time I heard of it, but I listened to that yesterday. Also, the weird thing is apparently in the um, the current Hulu miniseries uh, about Chippendales. That, that I was listening to Pop Culture Happy Hour about that, and then they were talking about how, like, Dorothy Stratton and her husband appear, but they don't yeah. really explain about, like, what, what happens after right. with that. I just learned about that, and Dan yeah. Stevens plays, uh, was it Paul Snyder? Paul Snyder, yeah. Anyway, um, horrifying actual story, and um, and really, really weirdly, Bob Fosse, just his last movie was uh, about that, uh, and uh, it is. I think it's. I I think it's very good. After that movie, you feel like you have to take a shower, but then also like I haven't seen like his stage work, which is you know what he mm-hmm. became so famous for. Um, I, I I think he was a great director. Uh, a really, really interesting filmmaker. I wish he had made more movies. Um, and because I'm kind of ignorant about so much of musical theater, I'm like aware of his significance and like some of his innovations. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I haven't seen those shows. and I haven't seen tapings of their shows. I, I, maybe, I, I didn't watch Liza with a Z, the Liza Minnelli concert special that he won an Emmy for directing. Oh. I was going to say, I think you should feel bad about it. I do. Daniel Dodd, or Dodd Dodderson, says, favorite content moment. Mary, do you know about content? No. <sighs> what is it? So, on the on the show Andor, yes. which I love so much, uh, so I did a podcast with David Chen covering Andor, mm. and um, my favorite character on Andor is Cyril Karn, the most pathetic loser in the galaxy. Oh. Uh he is this, uh, he is a sort of budding fascist who works for this I- imperial security company uh-huh. and he likes to follow rules. Uh-huh. And, uh, and he wants to like have more power at work, mm. but he sucks. And then he gets fired and has to move back home with his mother. Mary, there's a Star Wars show. He moves where, back home with his where mom? Where a major character <gasps> moves back home to an apartment with his mother and slurps the milk out of his cereal bowl. He, he is such a, and so I dubbed that, uh, any any scene with Karn is a Karn tent. <laughs> um, nice. uh, my favorite Karn tent moment. Uh, it well, I'm gonna say the very first scene with him, where his boss is like, "Did you get your uniform tailored?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah I had some uh, minor like uh, you know tailoring and uh, and like some piping and some color adjustments, but uh, you know like no- nothing major." And right away, when I was like, "Oh my god." <laughs> I have never seen a character like this in Star Wars before. He sucks so much, and I want him to be on screen always. Mm. Uh, so I'm not saying it's the best content scene, because we all know that the scene, you know, where uh, he tells Dendra Miro that she made him realize that there is, like, beauty and justice in the galaxy is one of the scenes of the year. But oh. that, oh my god, Mary, you've got to watch Andor. Um uh, but but that very first Karn scene, I think, sets the tone. Uh, it, th- th- that's yeah, like, and that that right there signaled to me that like, oh, this is the guy to watch on TV in 2022. This is going well. This is going well. We're good at this. Yeah. Doctor Ego Trip says, "Has your opinion on Matrix Resurrections changed at all in the years since you saw it?" Nope. Next question. Cool. Will I am not asks. Patrick, when they make an RRR sequel, would you be cool getting a cameo as a random colonizer getting attacked by a rhinoceros? There is nothing in the world <laughs> I would like more than that. Please, please, I will look like the biggest fucking loser piece of shit British guy, and I will get killed as mercilessly as they want. Wow. I don't know what this question means, but I'm going to ask it. I hope I can explain. Jubaka Defense asks, what weighs six ounces, sits in a tree, and is very dangerous? (laughs) What is it? 
a sparrow with a machine gun. It's a reference to the 60s Batman movie. It's one of the Riddler's oh, uh, skywriting okay. riddles. Yeah, I actually remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did know. I just didn't remember. Good question. Ooh. We like it. <laughs> CJD2K asks, what's your favorite midnight snack? I don't tend to have midnight snacks. Okay. I love this question because... Um, Mary does have midnight snacks. I, yeah, I do have a favorite midnight snack, but also I just resur resurrected what used to be my favorite game and oh, Patrick's no. least favorite game, which is called Tell Mary What to Eat. <laughs> you texted me about this at like 11 p.m. Well, we were texting about other things and then I was like, I'm hungry, what should I eat? Because um, I get very hungry and then I want to know what I should eat. <laughs> and then I, I want to know what I should eat. <laughs> trouble deciding. And then the way it always worked, which was like mainly in like middle school and high school, is Patrick would like put in some like good amount of like a good amount of brain power and effort just to being like, you could have that. We have this. Like you could put these two things together and make this nice snack. And then I would always be like, no, that's not what I want to eat. No, that's not quite it. And then at the end, I would pick something completely different that Patrick had not suggested. And he would be very frustrated, which is understandable. It was a huge but, waste of my time. <laughs> but um, it was a momentous moment because when we spoke on the phone last week, and well, first we, were te we texted and I was like, oh, what should I eat? And then you called me and then we were talking on the phone. I think it was because I was like, this is gonna take forever and I'm not gonna just be <laughs> typing ideas for an hour. And then you were like, well, I started lift, I, well, also I was alone in my apartment. So I had to do the work of listing options. So also took some of the, the workload off your shoulders. And then I was like, I have an apple and peanut butter. And you were like, you should have apple slices with peanut butter. And I actually took his suggestion for once and I enjoyed it. Now I will tell you what, what my- What a story, man. Now I will tell you what my favorite midnight snack is because Patrick doesn't have one. Okay, I call it toasted cheese. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have heard that they're, I think in Canada, they call um, a grilled cheese a toasted cheese. That's not what this is though. What this is, is that I toast two pieces of bread, preferably like sourdough bread, <laughs> keep you, going, keep you going. love it. And then I take a sharp block of cheddar cheese and then I grate the cheese, like a lot of cheese, like more cheese than I probably should. And then I take the two slices of toast warm from the oven and I pile the cheese on top between the toast and then it gets like a tiny bit melty but not too melty. And it's nice and crunchy and that's my favorite midnight snack. I love that there are people who are like, boy, I really hope Patrick answers my question about no. about about modern cinema and about filmmaking. Sorry. And then and then we're like, uh, no, we're just gonna have Mary discuss uh, toasted cheese uh, and uh, uh, eating. This is Mary. This is great. Thank you. Let's keep it going. Um, I accidentally pushed the button and I need you to log in. Oh. Ha-ha! Brian Metolius, a.k.a. the wonderful composer behind Night of the Coconut and all their music in the videos, asks... Order, order our vinyl soundtracks, available yes, now. Yes, it's out. Well, he says, Hi, Mary. Merry Christmas. What is the story behind Christmas milk? <laughs> <laughs> I like that this is another question that I'm answering. It's also about food and drinks. This came up on... for. Anyone who does not understand this, it mm -hmm. came up on the live stream. Currently, the live stream is only available for uh, members of the Patreon to watch, mm -hmm. but it's a good way to uh, spend a very loopy four hours. <laughs> and a beverage called Christmas Milk came up and mm -hmm. was drunk by me on it. And I mentioned that it was uh, introduced to me by Mary. I think I invented it. I, I, it's a little fuzzy. You might have been drunk. Well, it happened in college. So, okay, first of all, so Christmas milk is when you take a glass of milk and you add peppermint schnapps. I would say I do like one shot. Some people do like one and a half shots. Um, I personally think it should be much closer to like two thirds milk, one third schnapps. So, you know. You get drunk a lot faster varying, that way. Uh, you do get drunk faster that way. So if that's what you want, go for Patrick's technique. Um, so I 
have, I have dubbed it Christmas milk. I say that it tastes like Christmas in a glass. You have- It tastes like drinking a candy cane, it, really. Yes, it's amazing. You have the creaminess of the milk, and then you have the mintiness of the peppermint schnapps. And the alcohol of the peppermint schnapps. And it's great. Um, and I think my friends in college introduced me to peppermint schnapps in um, hot cocoa. And I was like, wow, this is really good. Um, and then I think I was trying to recreate it and I didn't have any hot cocoa, but I did have milk and I had schnapps and I put the two together and I was like, somehow this is actually more Christmassy than with the hot cocoa. Sometimes like the cocoa is a little too rich and then I don't want a lot of it, but you can have a lot of Christmas milk. And that is the origin of one of the great inventions uh, in the 21st century. Yeah, Christmas milk. You heard it here. Neo Geo wants to know, favorite comic books of the year, and can we get a semi-regular, smaller series on your comic reading? I'm not sure about any kind of semi-regular series uh, because I have so little free time. I don't know. If we can figure out a way, that could be fun. Favorite comics of the year. I'll probably talk about it in my best of 2022 video whenever that comes out in like a couple months. But, you know, I'm going to be a broken record. Um, as usual, all the stuff that Ed Brubaker came out with. I just read the new volume of Friday. I also got it from Mary for Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, loved it. Uh, I think the, the new Reckless books this year were fantastic. Um, oh, Miracle Man came back. Like like the the, the Neil Gaiman yeah. run on Miracle that left off in like 1994, it's back. It's really good. Uh, I can't believe it exists. Um, there's um, there's so many new comics this year. Catwoman Lonely City is really really good. Uh, the the four issue uh, miniseries by Cliff Chang. Uh, you would really like it. Yeah. For now, let's let's just say the, the the Brubaker stuff and Miracle Man and Catwoman. Good starting point. Yeah. Okay, Amber McIntyre asks a really big question. What is the ultimate way to eat a potato? Boiled, mashed, roasted? Boiled, mashed, Bile. roasted. Um, I, I also don't know That's what accent like I'm doing there. choosing between your children. Yeah. That's very hard. This is also a very Irish question. Yeah. Boiled is the one I do the least. Yes, agreed. I'm gonna say that. I know that's a classic staple of Irish meals. At least it's Irish meals that I've been to, mm -hmm. boiled potatoes. Mm -hmm. During like Christmas dinner, I and Thanksgiving, I make the mashed potatoes. They're really and good. I, He's very good at it. Thank you. Yeah. I really like mashed potatoes. I make roasted potatoes a lot back home. I actually make them a lot more than mashed. Mashed I only tend to do for it's like a, holiday it's meals. A lot of work. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to say roasted. I like them crispy on the outside and then you slice in mm -hmm. and it's like soft on the inside. I'm going to go with the same answer. Yeah. It's a weird thing where I prefer the taste of my mashed potatoes, but roasted are more versatile. They go with more things. Jacob Juice or Use um, asked a very cute question. Dear Patrick and Mary, this is a question for you both. I know you like wine, <laughs> but do you also have a beer you both like? Thank you so much. Best, Jacob from Holland. Jacob, uh, that was so nice. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. So I'll go first. Sure. I've never really been a beer guy. In a bar, I usually don't order a beer. I'll usually go to like cocktails or whiskey or something. And if it's like a specific like beer focused place, I usually go for like a stout. Mm -hmm. Like very stereotypical Irish answer, but uh, Guinness is like usually what I'll go for mm -hmm. or something because Guinness is a stout or something kind of like it. Mary, you actually enjoy beer like normally more well, than I do. Um, two years ago, uh, beer started to kind of upset my stomach, which mm. is a bit of a bummer. So I don't drink it much anymore. Um, I like sour. I like a Hefeweizen. Um, I do really like an IPA. I live in Vermont. We have a lot of, um, <laughs> we have a lot of IPAs there. We have a lot of microbreweries. Not a fan. Um, I really like the Fiddlehead IPA. Um, so, so you, proper answers. Yeah. This is a good question. Ooh, what is from it? From Yinch. Will you be featuring your parents again in future videos? They are amazing. I love that you and Mary are continuing the annual Q&A. You were all wonderful on camera. Yinch, that's so nice. Thank you. That's so sweet. Uh, Mary, aren't you so happy that we're continuing this? Yes. Are you having a great time? Yes. Yinch, what I'm going to say is I really hope 
that you have watched the latest video because our and parents are, are in it. So in it th there's and your answer. Great. And it's not like that video ends and it's like, and then the parents went away and never returned. I mean, like, they're going to come back. No, they love it. They love being in it. You love having them in it. The real question is, when is Mary going to appear? This is the real question. In you, the narrative. You know what? I'm throwing it out there to the audience, and this is great because I don't read the comments section. Mm. Viewers. Oh boy. Please give me ideas for how to introduce Mary to oh. the narrative. And that said, Mary has appeared in videos before, mm -hmm. but it's been a few years. But yeah, how do we introduce Mary? Because Mary should be in the videos. The problem is she lives in Vermont. It was a lot easier when she lived in the... Mary used to live a 20-minute walk from yeah. my apartment, and then she'd move to a different state. I did. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, Matt used to live in my apartment, oh, and then he I moved see. four hours away. Sometimes people move. Why don't people from other places move closer to me? That does happen too. Svensational guy says in all caps, Can you not make Adam Cannon? <laughs> can you not make Adam He Cannon? says, Can you not make Adam Cannon? Sven? That's been the policy here at Patrick H. Willems HQ, and it continues to be our policy. I think I, I think I'm doing a really great job not making Adam Cannon, and it makes me happy. Well, it's interesting you said that. Another tweet we received from Adam Lance Garcia. Oh no! <laughs> says, does Mary think you should finally hashtag make Adam Cannon? I say yes. I think it. I, I like it. It's. It would be interesting. No. I think <laughs> this is. This, like I what, can't. I, I don't even know what would happen. I can't even picture what would happen. I have never experienced betrayal <laughs> on this level in my life. But what, what? I'm just so curious. Like, what's gonna happen? Everything would come. Would collapse. <laughs> it would be ruined. <laughs> Why? Adam's smile would get even bigger and it would break his face. That does seem impossible, so maybe for his safety. How could you do this well, to me? Well, I'm just, he asked. I'm not saying you have to. He said, what do I, Mary, what you, does Mary think? You've met him. Yes, he's very nice. Ha, don't you know that you need to be mean to him? <laughs> no. Like, look at this guy. No. He's like begging you to like make fun of him and be mean to him no. and reject him and not make him canon. You can't give him what he wants. But what if you did? No. <laughs> well. No. What do the people think? I don't I mean, give a shit. This is some, my channel. Somebody I, just said, don't make him canon. So you definitely have votes on your side as well. Yeah. And also, and the funny thing is, these are all just from Twitter. And uh, like 75% of the people watching this are just like, what are they talking about? I can't believe you betrayed me like this. Is that the last question? Um, I don't know. It's 9 p.m. <laughs> During this long time. I feel like, should we ask another late one? Yeah, yeah, because you kind of killed the mood. Sorry. This is a nice, light, fun one to vibe you. Jonas Dowerdoc wants to know, what did you give each other for Christmas this year? I know from previous years, you take this very seriously. That is true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first? I think the thing that I was most excited to give Patrick was How do we explain this? A custom felt banner that I had ordered to be made that said in very large letters, Don't you hate pants? Because we have this shared love of this one scene on on an episode of The Simpsons. The Canyon Arrow episode. The one where Krusty becomes like a stand-up comic. He's kind of like gritty. And, and he's telling people to burn money. Yeah. And uh, And there's the scene where Homer goes to a show and he's like, I really hope he tells us to burn our pants. These things are driving me nuts. I hope he tells us to burn our pants. These things are driving me nuts. And then when Krusty's doing his set, at one point in the, mid in the middle, Homer just shouts out, Don't you hate pants? <laughs> Don't you hate pants? It's great. At like the back of the room. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we have found this really funny since we were children, and we quote it consistently. Yeah. And uh, anyway, Mary made me a whole banner that said, don't you hate pants? Well, you ordered a, I ordered a custom banner for me. I had been wanting to make it for years and I didn't have time. So I was like, we're going to outsource this. Yeah, so now I have to find a place in my apartment to hang up a banner yeah. that says, don't you hate pants. You should use it as a backdrop. 
I could. And then you'll get so many questions. So many questions. Because yeah. I'll also be wearing pants at the time. And be like, <laughs> like, you hypocrite. You could just be shot from the waist up and then it could be a mystery. Is Patrick wearing pants? He hates them. Ooh, that's that's how, how I'll get engagement on the videos. <laughs> Comments are good. Thousands of people being like, is he wearing pants? I don't know, it's hard to tell. <laughs> The way he shifted, it, look, look, and let's analyze and zoom in on that pixel right there. You got me other things too. Uh huh. I made you an oven mitt um, in the Patrick Willems colors. It has. With Paddington patterned lining? Yes, it's got Paddington lining. And then it has yellow, yellow. Oh, and together we are the Patrick colors and also kind of the oven mitt colors. Now our powers combine, we are Patrick Willems. <laughs> Um, what were you most excited to give me? Um, well, so I, as usual, because uh, Mary likes comic books a lot, but often uh, falls behind on things or like doesn't pick them up on her own. And mm -hmm. so I was like, well, Mary, I got to get you updated. I mean, like, so here's like the latest volumes of Saga. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the new volume of Friday, stuff like that. Oh, I got you a, a, a Studio Ghibli uh, cookbook. The big thing was uh, I got Mary a jacket that was kind of oh, like her yeah, big it's ticket really item. Nice. It's Mary so wanted a nice. kind of like a like canvas like work jacket. Yeah, like a chore jacket, but one that would be warm. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and so I got her this Patagonia work jacket. It's really nice. It fits perfectly. And I also got you a lot of um, Miyazaki themed gifts. You did. Well. I got him uh, the Kiki Slivery Service novel. That the movie's based on? Um, I got him. A little no face ornament? Yes. I got him uh, Shuna's Journey, which is the manga that Miyazaki wrote and illustrated. Um, that's the precursor to Princess Mononoke. Yeah, so. that, they came out in like the early 80s, but it was, yeah. it was just like reissued this year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we did pretty well. Yeah. Um, we also our, got our parents' good stuff too. Our gifts are as nerdy as you might expect. I got you a jacket for outdoors. I know, but also comics. Yeah, but I got you a jacket. <laughs> a jacket. <laughs> anyway, we should probably end this. We're, it's devolving. It's, we're, it is, we're getting loopy. Sorry I talked so much about snacks. They, um, they wanted to know. But hopefully you wanted to know. I mean, I feel like most of these people want to know about movies and, and your opinions on movies, and I've kind of co-opted the Q&A to talk about snacks. <sighs> Whatever. Again, we, ha we have all these other Q&A videos about, like, uh, you know, the regular videos. And so, like, look, this is the Christmas one, and the Christmas one has its own interesting dynamic. Uh, it's got a vibe. You don't know what to expect from this one, because ah. Mary's, Mary's a wild card. I'm a wild card. Also, if <laughs> I'm it, a maverick. <laughs> You're, you're, Mary's a maverick just like um, Pete Maverick Mitchell in those two movies that Mary hasn't seen. I haven't. Um, Mary, Mary got, you, you got it. Um, also, if anyone just has uh, tickets that they don't need to the Eras tour, uh, let us know. Let us know. Specifically for the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, unless, I don't know, it wouldn't be funny if we like flew to like Tennessee. Yeah, I've never been there. I Neither go. have I. Yeah, let us know. Um, we are nice people, and this would be a, a, a we'd be a good home for them. Um, we'd be a good home. We'd be a good home. <laughs> uh, it's any, anyway, th <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you so much for writing in. Thank you for, um, for watching this we far. We really enjoy this. And we will see you again next year. Bye. Bye.